Hello and welcome to this, the fifth and final vlog in this series of dental negligence vlogs from the clinical negligence team at Number 5 Chambers. These vlogs are aimed at dental negligence lawyers, providing an insight from dental experts as to how they think that lawyers can improve their chances of success and minimise their costs. In the previous four vlogs, we discussed which expert to instruct, what the expert needs from the lawyer, communication and part 35 questions. Today, we will be discussing the topic of oral cancer. Such claims for misdiagnosis or negligent treatment can be both serious, as such breaches can have disastrous consequences for a claimant, and also of high value. Thus, in our opinion, it is important that both claimant and defendant dental negligence lawyers have an understanding of the topic, should such a claim ever fall into their lap. Today, I am joined by Mr. Lawrence Newman, Dr. Lucy Nichols and Mr. Henry Pitchers QC. Mr. Lawrence Newman is a consultant in maxillofacial and head and neck surgery and a dental expert in the field. And Dr. Lucy Nichols is a general dental practitioner and dental expert and has very helpfully joined us for each of these dental negligence vlogs. Mr. Henry Pitchers QC is a silk at number five chambers, member of the clinical negligence group and head of the personal injury group. Uh, Mr. Newman, perhaps I could start by asking you a couple of questions. Would you be happy, please, to tell us a little about the prevalence of oral cancer and how it typically presents? Uh, absolutely. If I can share the screen, it might be helpful. So I'll just uh, give you an overview of uh, oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma, which is the most commonly occurring mouth cancer. For the, I'm sure everybody understands what the mouth is. Um, but what the mouth isn't, and some of the uh, online um, portals refer to mouth cancer increasing because of tongue-based cancer and palatine tonsil cancer, which is incorrect because that's in the oropharynx. So the mouth is essentially from the soft palate forwards. So figures from the soft, the oropharynx are not included in that. Um, this is an old um, uh, representation of um, the incidence per 100,000 population of mouth cancer and you can see the UK was is seventh from the bottom and on there it gives an incidence of five per hundred thousand population and these are figures going back some 20 years. The most up-to-date figures show that the incidence per um, hundred thousand has increased to 12 per hundred thousand representing about 8,000 people um, in the UK in a population of what 65 million uh, who get mouth cancer so in, in uh, essence, it's a rare cancer, but we do, are seeing an increasing number, probably because of more uh, drinking and certainly a resurgence in smoking and more women are smoking than they used to. And then there's the argument about HPV. Now, it, it's the relevance of uh, HPV, uh, human papillomavirus, is it has caused a massive increase in oropharynx cancer, but not in mouth cancer, uh, although there may be an association with the young, but I think we're still assessing whether that's the case or not. So what does it look like? Well, um, the suspicious mind would see lesions like this and think clearly it's not right. And these three cases are uh, potentially malignant conditions, various red and white patches of the mouth cavity, which overall have a, a varying uh, preponderance to undergo malignant transformation. But anything like that clearly uh, is abnormal and merits uh, a, a referral and, and biopsy in the hospital service. Uh, a lesion like this, a mixed red and white lesion on the bottom, so probability you'd say uh, is uh, certainly uh, most likely a cancer. Uh, you can see that sort of heaped up red appearance in the middle of the big paler pinky appearance and that bit I'm sure is cancerous. And there can be little doubt that lesions such as this are barn door appearances of mouth cancer, yet you'd be surprised how many people have had three courses of antibiotics for this before they're referred in. Um, you may wonder why I've got a picture of a blues guitarist on here, but as we're entering muddy waters uh, and talking about tumour doubling time, uh, this is a highly contentious issue about how quick cancer grows. You can see that um, equation there for working out tumour volume doubling time. And in my humble opinion, of the five variables there, you only know one, which is the interval time, and everything else is up for grabs. And 
Dublin time is contentious. I'm not a fan, but it's probably the best guide that we have. And it's based on patients having delay to radiotherapy uh, and, and looking at scans. But in the real world, we don't see cancers for this long because mouth cancers, the treatment is surgery. And usually within six or seven weeks of seeing them, you've operated on them and the cancer is gone. So when we say the doubling time is three months, four months, two months, we've, we've removed it within six weeks. So I'm not quite sure if we're actually talking sense about that. So that's my overview of mouth cancer. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Newman. That was really helpful and interesting. Really helpful to see some images as well. Um, so do you have, um, based on what you said then, an idea of how rapidly oral cancer develops or does it vary depending on the case? So I'll tell you what I've, I've seen in clinical practice for many years. Um, and I've spoken to colleagues uh, around, around the country about their experience. And we all have a similar experience. So in the, for the vast majority of mouth cancers, if, if I was to see a patient today uh, for the first time, for the, I would say for the vast majority of the mouth cancers, we, op we will operate on probably in five or six weeks' time by the time they've been through the scanning process, been discussed at the head neck MDT once or twice, have a chat with the patient, et cetera. They're going to get their surgery probably within four or six weeks from the first day you see them on, based on how busy you are. But that's a ballpark figure. And the vast majority of those patients, when you look at the cancer, on the day you remove it, it's very similar to what you saw on day one. Once or twice a year, we all get our fingers, not burnt, but you, you've got a patient you're gonna go operate on and, and you have a look before you send them to sleep and you say, hang on a minute, something has changed here. This has grown out of all proportion. All bets are off, we need to go back, we need to regroup and stage this again. But that is a rarity and that's just not just me speaking. Many of my colleagues up and down the land have a similar experience. Okay, thank you. So would you say that usually relatively slow growing with the odd exception? I think so. And, and, and if you go back to the tumour volume doubling times, the, what most of the literature says, if you believe it, is it says most mouth cancers have a doubling time of around 100 days and the fast growing ones have a doubling time of 30 days. That's what's in the literature. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lucy Nichols, would you be happy, please, to talk us through the NICE guidelines with regard to what a general dental practitioner should do when presented with a suspicious lesion? Yes, of course. So we have to consider the 2005 guidelines and then the 2015 guidelines. Um, as time has gone on, there are obviously less and less cases where we may need to refer to the 2005 guidelines. So that's going forward, that's probably quite unlikely, but it is interesting to see that there are some differences between them. So um, notably, um, both sets of guidelines talk about um, lumps or ulceration in the mouth that's unexplained and persists for more than three weeks. Um, and they also talk about red patches or red and white patches. The 2005 guidelines also include unexplained tooth mobility, but that isn't in the 2015 guidelines. Interestingly as well, um, neither set of guidelines includes anything about an extraction socket that fails to heal. Um, I found in the dental negligence cases that I've had related to oral cancer, quite a few of them have actually involved cases where there's been an extraction site that's failed to heal. The patient has come back repeatedly over several months um, with the, the socket not healing properly and um, has been given, had the socket washed out, um, being given several courses of antibiotics before they're finally referred. Um, in my opinion, it's it's um, basic undergraduate knowledge, and it's in it would be in most textbooks that a socket that fails to heal is a sign of a potential oral cancer. So I'm very surprised that this hasn't made it into either set of guidelines, particularly um, from the dental negligence cases that I've come across, where it seems to be something that's cropped up quite a lot. Um, so for those cases, 
Um, I have found criticism in the past, um, even though it's not something that's actually in the guidelines. Thank you. Yes, that's interesting, isn't it, that, that it hasn't made its way into the guidance? Yes, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm quite surprised about that, and I actually feel, particularly with the cases that I've dealt with, I feel quite strongly that, that it's something that should be in the guidelines. And and with the unexplained tooth mobility that was in the guidelines and has now been taken out, it's often a case of that the patient has the tooth taken out because it's uncomfortable and mobile. So you've already got the unexplained tooth mobility and then they take the tooth out. The dentist may be not having a really clear idea of why the tooth is mobile or has maybe um, uh, considered um, without sufficient evidence that the tooth mobility is related to periodontal disease and takes the tooth out and then the socket fails to heal. So you've got both often unexplained tooth mobility and the failure of the socket to heal. And all of this can go over the course of many, many months. Um, Henry, what difficulties, if any, do you see in establishing breach in a case like that? Well, I think the first thing to say is that, maybe say the obvious, there's no special rules that apply to these sort of clinical negligence cases. So breach of duty is going to be judged by reference to the normal test under Bolam and, and Blytho. Um, and the court will have to ask itself whether the standard of care, which was in fact applied, was such as would, would be regarded as reasonable by a responsible body of uh, of dentists. And of course, it's for the for the claimant to prove that um, and we'll need expert evidence to support it. Uh, what I would say, though, is that there are some clinical negligence cases, so looking at the matters more broadly, where judges struggle to determine the standard of care, particularly when you're looking at matters of clinical judgment. And I do think this is an area where the presence of the NICE guidelines, although we've heard about perhaps an omission with those guidelines, but the presence of those guidelines is going to be very useful to trial judges. It's going to be reassuring to them to be able to cross-reference, if you like, an objective document to see whether or not this is a patient who should have been referred. And, and, and generally speaking, these cases all turn on whether the claimant on a particular day should have been referred uh, for urgent follow-up for suspected cancer. So the, the guidelines are going to be central to your consideration as an expert, but also as advisors, legal advisors to the claimant. Um, I think it's also fair to say that this is not, the guidelines are not statutes, that they won't be interpreted by uh, the court so mechanistically. There is scope for arguments of interpretation. For example, you know, what constitutes induration, which is my understanding is, is a degree of hardening. What's, what's abnormal uh, at the level that would tick the right box in the, the NICE guidelines. So you, you, you're going to have these arguments between the experts about how you should interpret the guidelines. But probably most commonly, you're going to be looking at evidential issues, which will be trying to establish to the court's satisfaction how the claimant presented on the on the on the day uh, or on the days in question. You know what what would a competent history have been if they'd been asked, and perhaps more importantly, what would a competent examination have revealed? And, and the reason why this is problematic is because th these cancers are often missed, as I understand it, in routine appointments. And in a sense, the person's probably only gone to a lawyer because the dentist who saw them wasn't concerned, didn't consider it suspicious, considered it to be a matter of, of routine. And, and often the record keeping will reflect that because they, they weren't that concerned. The notes are brief. There may be gaps. There may be equivocation, ambiguity in them. And then, of course, the defendant themselves, the, the, the dentist themselves, is unlikely to carry an independent recollection particularly because, not just the passage of time, but it wouldn't have been a particularly memorable uh, encounter with that patient. Um, so there are a number of reasons why um, the records may not be uh, a strong guide. Um, obviously, if they are, that's going to be weigh very heavily for the trial judge. The dentists themselves may not be able to assist the court. So you need to consider where else the court may get assistance. And if the claimant's own evidence plainly is going to be important. They, their witness statement, if you're advising the claimant, needs to, to descend very carefully to the particulars as to how they were on this occasion and try and explain 
how the claimant is able to give that evidence in a way that is that is reliable, um, because it's probably going to be the turn on the precise findings as to how the claimant presented as to whether or not the guidelines mandated uh, a two week suspected cancer uh, referral. Beyond that, what I would say is look at the subsequent clinical evidence. So when the claimant was finally seen in hospital, what history was taken? Because at that point, there probably will be a very careful history taken that should set out the course of the disease. And that may help to shed light on how the claimant was on the date of the alleged breach. There may also be things, if you like, deduction from subsequent histological findings or subsequent radiological investigations. So you can identify a later point uh, the size of the tumour. We've talked about tumour doubling times. And to some extent, you can try and extrapolate backwards to try and work out how it would have been uh, on the particular day. So what I would say is, um, obviously, you have to take the lead from your breach of duty expert, but don't feel shy about calling on your causation expert on this matter of breach to try and work out how the claimant was uh, uh, at the material uh, appointment. So th those are my observations um, based on some experience of these cases, including a matter that went to trial. And uh, so the sort of practical issues you're going to find uh, in relation to breach of duty. Yes, thank you, Henry. Um, Lucy, have you experienced any difficulties arising with safety netting, uh, monitoring of what are considered to be low risk lesions in primary care? And any breaches of duty there? Um, well, I, I do have cases where um, there are lesions that are monitored. Um, well, I mean, quite quite a few cases I've had have been cases of recurrent ulceration, and and I mean, an ulcer is something that you would want to monitor and and check again. Um, within three weeks to check that it's resolved. Um, I've had cases where the notes would seem to suggest that, that an ulcer has resolved, but it's then come back. And the claimant suggested that it never really went and it was there the whole time. And maybe maybe the dentist just didn't, didn't notice it the next time that they were there. So um, things can get a bit confusing when you get those two different accounts. Yes. And I wondered if there are any cases where you've had um, dentists monitoring a lesion um, and deciding to safety net rather than referring urgently. Um, no, no, not really. Not not really. The, um, depending on what kind of lesion you mean. Um, but usually my, most unexplained lesions would be referred either urgently or non-urgently. And on the whole, um, Cases that I've had that it's not been cases where the criticism is that the referral was non-urgent rather than urgent. It's the, the, the criticism is that the urgent referral should have been done from the outset. Thank you. Coming back to you then, Mr. Newman, if I may, are there any breaches that you tend to see in relation to treatment or management of oral cancer in secondary care? Cases referred in from primary care, you mean? In the second, in the secondary care setting? Yes, so do you, yes, have you seen any, come across any breaches on a regular basis that you tend to see in relation to treatment in the secondary care setting? Nothing jumps out. Um, I mean, once the patients are in the, in the hospital, uh, the diagnosis, you see them in the clinic, the diagnosis is fairly uh, obvious. Clinically, you do a biopsy just to confirm it. Um, and then the MDTs are pretty switched on in my experience and everybody gets on and does, uh, treats the patients according to the uh, various uh, approved guidelines. Uh, the NICE guidance 2016 that came out uh, is um, for, for the majority of people. There's occasional delays because common delays you find are access to imaging for staging of the disease, but that's a reflection of the, uh, forget the pandemic and all the, all the problems the pandemic scored outside the pandemic, uh, getting patients into a scanner is usually the rate limiting step in my experience. And so that delays the process, but delaying a week or so 
probably makes little if no difference to outcome. And when it comes to causation in oral cancer cases, what sort of issues typically arise? So the common the common scenario I see uh, is a delay in, in referral. Uh, the patient has been jollied along for a period of time, as we've heard, they're given several courses of antibiotics. Uh, it doesn't get better. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get better. Keep keep doing the same thing, and then they're referred in uh, weeks or, in some cases, months down the line. Uh, it is relevant for the patient because it reflects the treatment that they have because if like all cancers um, the sooner you get to treat it the better the prognosis in terms of survival but also the treatment required is um, significantly different uh, in 2016 the NICE guidance came out and put forward the concept of sentinel lymph node biopsy for early oral cavity cancer which means small uh, T1 or it says T1 or T2 but in the real world people don't do it for T2 but they do it for T1 cancers, which means sub two centimeters. And so if you get a mouth cancer that's under two centimeters, you can have it uh, a wide local resection and a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And for 70% of the patients, that's all they're going to need. If you wind the clock forwards, and let's say there's been a delay in uh, their referral to you, and by the time they get to you, they're T2 or T3 with metastatic disease in the neck then they're going to get resection, tracheostomy, some form of feeding tube, neck dissection, 60% or so will get radiotherapy and, and of course, a, a reduction in their five-year uh, disease-specific survival. So it does make a big difference. Is it difficult for you to say with accuracy how much better the prognosis would have been had the oral cancer been detected at an early stage or um, does it depend on the circumstances? It's all driven by uh, T and M staging, really, uh, as, as best as we know. Um, there's surprisingly poor figures out there uh, that, that's available to everybody. Um, but if you look at the general figures that are available, uh, both here and in, uh, there's a thing called the SEER database in the States, which is a similar demographic of patients, but they've got 300 million of them as opposed to 660 million we've got in the UK, so it's a bigger cohort to look at outcomes upon a similar uh, target base. Um, Five-year survival, for example, for a T1 is around 80 something percent and drops to 20-ish percent for a T4. That's, a, that's an astronomical change. And if you get metastatic disease in the neck, then the, the teaching is that a positive neck node reduces your five-year survival 50%. So it's important. Yes. Um, Henry, do you have any further comments on the causation point? Yeah, it, I mean, again, it's not new principles, but some well-established principles come particularly into play in these cases when, as we've heard, we're predominantly looking at a delayed referral, so a delayed diagnosis and delayed treatment. Now, obviously, what you're trying to establish is what would have happened had there not been a breach of duty. So had there been a proper referral, what would the outcome have been? Which is easy to state, but obviously maybe difficult to, to unpick in practice. Now, obviously, it's established on the balance of probabilities. Uh, again, obviously, you, you assume that the subsequent management would have been competent, not negligent. And you have to look at, if you like, two aspects. The first is plotting the factual timeline. When is it likely that the various stages would have taken place? And then you've got to apply the medical uh, expert evidence to that to look at the extent to which the course and the outcome would have been different, if at all, uh, with that earlier referral. And in terms of the factual timeline, which is probably um, the thing that perhaps causes the most difficulty evidentially for lawyers. Now, there'll be lots of stages probably for you to try uh, and plot. First, you know, firstly, when would the referral have been made? Would it have been urgent? When then would that claimant have been seen uh, in hospital? How would they have presented? What investigations would have been required? And when would they have happened? And that could be, as we've heard, biopsy or, or radiological. When would the multidisciplinary team meeting 
have, have taken place at which decisions would have been made about definitive treatment. When would the surgery have happened? Would there have been any adjuvant therapies alongside? Um, and when would they have started? And so, uh, apologies for so many rhetorical questions, but th those are the things you will have to work through. And there are some common mistakes, I think, that are made. The first is, is to mix up breach of duty and causation. And this is applies not just in these kind of cases. When you're looking at a, a likely timeline, you're not taking the longest interval that wouldn't be negligent. What you're looking at, what is in fact the likely interval for each of those uh, stages. What you shouldn't do, unless you're, unless you're really struggling, is simply to take national averages either. You're looking at what would have happened to this claimant if referred to this particular hospital. And therefore, of course, you're going to get help from looking at what actually happened when that claimant was, uh, in fact, referred. But don't assume that the intervals will be the same, because, of course, if they had presented earlier, their condition may have been less uh, drastic, may not have been treated with the same degree of expedition that actually happened when it was later, later uh, referred. Also, d don't just assume that you can ignore prosaic matters like what day of the week it was. Uh, obviously, we know that uh, weekend care can be different to weekday care. Uh, from the case of mine, we also learned that, in fact, the MDT, the head and neck MTTs, only happened every other week. So it depended where you, when the referral would have happened. Uh, it was every, I think it was every other Wednesday, for example. But even if it's every week, still, you know, there are weeks here and there that can be uh, could be important to the to the outcome and the ultimate assessment uh, of causation so i think those are those are some of the common mistakes it's applying the usual principles but really focusing on the particular claimant the particular hospital uh, and plotting that timeline carefully because although some of these tumors may be slow growing i think it's fair to say that some of them are also very aggressive and in the in a matter of weeks a, a tumor can can progress quite dramatically in terms of the surgical excision that, that is required. And I know from the case I had, you know, really in, in the space of a month, the, the, a claimant went from uh, uh, needing surgical excision to needing a full neck dissection and the, the tumor would actually burst through their cheek and they had jaw reconstruction and so on. So the cosmetic difference was potentially quite significant for them. Yes, thank you. Um, well, Thank you very much um, to Mr. Henry Pitchers QC, Mr. Newman and Dr. Nichols for joining me today for the final vlog in the series. Uh, thank you to all of my colleagues at Number 5 Chambers who have assisted in the making of these vlogs and to all the experts who have dedicated some of their precious time to working with me on them. I hope that the vlogs have been helpful if you've been watching them as a brief overview of some things to think about when conducting dental negligence litigation. Should anyone watching feel that they would like to discuss any of the topics that we have covered further or like to discuss anything else in relation to dental negligence, for example, dental charting, please do not hesitate to get in touch. Thank you to everyone for watching and goodbye from all of us for now. Thank you. Thank you.